Hey gang, this is Bonica call, uh, talking to you from the last homely house. Uh, I'm going to do a short video today about personal financial management, specifically controlling expenditures. This is based on a lecture I give uh, to my seniors, and it'll be the first of several lectures on personal financial management. This is really meant for early careerists, people who are just graduating from college or, or high school and getting out on their own for the first time. This is definitely not meant for financial professionals. But if you've got a young person in your life that needs to learn some basics about uh, financial success, hopefully this will be useful to you. So, um, so I want to kind of frame this for a second. The, uh, the key, the foundation to successful financial management, uh, personal financial management, is to is to keep expenses below income. Now, that's a pretty basic idea. Unfortunately, a lot of people really struggle to do that. Um, so I want to, today, I'm going to talk through some basics of thinking about, in particular, expenses. Um, you know, it's not just young people, and it's not just people, you know, people without a lot of income. Uh, I have a friend who's a CPA, and I remember her telling me a story about how she used to do taxes for a, for a person who was an executive with a um, large company. And on the, at night and weekends, he would drive uh, and deliver pizzas for, because he had allowed his expenses to exceed his rather significant uh, uh, personal income. And so what we want to do is avoid that sort of thing in our life, right? Because if you're, if you're an executive for a, for a large firm and you're driving around at night delivering pizzas, you've done something wrong. Now, there's nothing wrong with delivering pizzas in and of itself, right? But you don't want to be spending your free time doing that or driving an Uber or whatever, um, what you want to do is manage your finances in such a way that you don't have to do those things. So I'm going to talk about how to think about uh, your expenses, and hopefully it'll be useful for you to kind of, as you proceed in your own personal lives, uh, to, to achieve a level of personal financial freedom, which is what we're really after. I'm going to switch my view here. Okay, so my basic idea is that we've got some amount of resources available to us, right? And these resources are coming in in the form of income, and they're going out in the form of expenses that we need. Uh, either we must spend or we would like to spend, right? So some things are musts and some things uh, we have choices about. But let's start by, I'm not really going to talk a lot about income, but uh, in, in this in this video, I'm mostly focused on expenses. But the basic idea here is that we've got some amount of, of um, income coming in from our job. And I'm going to just kind of focus here on people with a job that has a relatively fixed amount of income. Uh, so most Americans have jobs. Most Americans are not working uh, uh, on a uh, commission basis. Most Americans are not entrepreneurs where the, their income fluctuates a whole lot from uh, week to week. Most Americans have jobs and the income is relatively fixed. Now, what I'm going to be talking to you here is you can, you're going to be easily able to poke holes and see like, what about, you know, so-and-so and something else, right? This is what I'm going to talk to you today is meant to cover 90% of America. And then the other 10%, we can talk about all the details. But for 90% for of you out there, um, this is going to work just fine. So income, right? And if we have um, income is gr greater than our expenses, this creates financial freedom, right? This gap between income and expenses, because right now we have zero expenses over a 30-day period. Um, all we have is income coming in. So this gap between income and expenses is really our financial freedom or in, um, you know, in military terms, given my military background, right? This is, this is your maneuver space, right? This is, you're creating a space to maneuver. So the more space you can create between your income and your expenses, the more freedom you have, the more freedom to maneuver or the more freedom to decide what you want to do with your life. The less room you have 
the more you're going to be stressed about making sure that you are bringing in enough income to cover your expenses. And you're going to potentially wind up like the executive who was driving for a pizza company. Okay. So what I've got running on the bottom is 30 days, right? Meant to be a typical month, right? 30, 31 days, whatever, right? And so income is not really rising or falling with respect to the number of days. It's pretty much independent of the number of days of the month. It is a fixed amount. You get paid, you know, whatever it is you make, $1,000 a week, whatever, um, you know, uh, some more, some less, but whatever it is you have, it's pretty, you know, assuming you have a job and a salary, the income is independent of the number of days in the month, right? It's just going to be a set amount coming in. Uh, so that's why it's characterized by a straight line. Now, let's start to talk about uh, uh, expenses, all right? Because we've got our income. We know that that's a fixed amount. So I want to talk about expenses, and I'm going to give you a kind of simple heuristic model. Right? Heuristic is like simple rules. And again, it's super simple, right? This is not meant to be a perfect model of every possible contingency. This is meant to cover 90% of people in 90% of what you're up to, right? So I'm going to do a simple two by two to kind of to categorize expenses. So we have mandatory expenses which are expenses that we cannot do away with. The expenses that go in this row can never go to zero, okay? And then we have discretionary expenses, which means they have some degree of optionality to them. Expenses that are in this row could potentially be driven to zero, okay? So the things we'll put in this row will be things that we could delete from our lives. And the things that we'll put in this row are things that we don't have any choice about. All we can do is try to manage them. Then the nature of the expense is either fixed in over a 30-day period, right? Um, because they're, they're flexible uh, in the long run, or they're flexible. So we'll think of them as fixed in the, in the short run or flexible in the short run. So let's start by kind of filling this in. So now we have four possible categories of expenses. We have mandatory fixed, mandatory flexible, discretionary fixed, discretionary flexible, right? So then we have combinations here. So under the mandatory fixed, what kind of things are absolutely necessary and they don't vary. Once you commit to them, they're, they're, they're a fixed amount. And I would say the biggest one for most households is rent, right? And by rent, I mean the cost of putting a roof over your head, whether that's a mortgage or, or a lease, doesn't matter. You can change the word if you'd like, if it'll make you happier. Um, but rent typically represents the most significant expense for any given household. And if you watch the video uh, Nomadland, um, one of the comments made by uh, one of the homeless people that lives in their van is that Rent is, in fact, the most significant expense for people to live on. And so these people in, in, you know, that were profiled in nomad land uh, give up their fixed residence to move into a vehicle uh, to reduce that uh, huge fixed expense. Okay, so we have rent. Uh, most of us don't want to live in a van down by the river, right? Then I would say another important fixed expense is health insurance. And I'll do another podcast about uh, insurance, including health insurance. But you absolutely have to have health insurance unless you are independently wealthy, you're Bill Gates or you're Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos, right? In which case they just buy the hospital and then, you know, if they need it. Uh, but for the rest of us, you absolutely need health insurance because it'll, it can protect you from financial ruin. Now, this is not your total spend on healthcare, right? This is just the health insurance. So this is the fixed amount that you're going to be paying for your premiums month over month over month over month. So that's going to be a fixed amount, $400, $500, whatever it is that you, you know, uh, that you pay. Um, so those are two examples of mandatory fixed expenses. So let's go back to our graph and put that on here. Well, if we're looking at the progression of rent over a 30 day period, much like income, that's a fixed number. So I'm going to draw a flat line here to represent rent, right? So rent, whatever it is, whether it's $500 a month or 500,000, you know, $500 a month, if you live up in say Berlin, New Hampshire, up in the North country, 
or five, you know, five hundred thousand dollars a month if you live in Back Bay, Boston. I just saw that brownstones are selling for five point five million dollars. That's a, by the way, that's a that's a townhouse in uh, Boston. They call them brown brownstones. Um, five point five million dollars, right, for a for a condo. Uh, that's a little bit crazy, um, but if you have the money, I suppose that's fine. Um, so we have rent, right? It doesn't change. It's a fixed expense over 30 days. It's not going to increase uh, uh, over days. You pay one rent payment per month. So these is an example of a mandatory fixed expense. And then we'd add on here property. Health insurance is a pretty big chunk, right? Also a, a single payment that covers the entire month. And it doesn't like increase with with time, we're not going to buy more health insurance uh, uh, over over the course of a normal month. We may change over the from year to year, but we're not going to buy more in in the midst of any given month. Um, so those are so what we see happening now is the expenses are starting to rise, right? So these are expenses are closing, are shrinking our maneuver space, right? They are shrinking our financial freedom. So, but we don't have any choice. You got to pay rent. You got to pay health insurance. So coming back to our uh, two by two. So you could probably come up with other mandatory fixed expenses. I would still argue, be careful deciding whether you put them in the mandatory column or the discretionary column. So what goes in the discretionary column? Well, somebody might say, well, no, I'm going to put my car payment up here. I would argue, no, car payments are discretionary. And I would argue, why do I argue that? Well, first of all, a car provides two primary functions. Car, right? A little graphic here. Here's my little car, right? My wheels, and here's me driving my car. Eee, right? What does a car do? Well, it gets me, uh, it gives me transportation. That's the primary function of a, of, a, of a car. Actually, I don't drive a car. I drive a um, minivan. So this is really me. Um, I drive a 2004 Honda Odyssey. It has 186,000 miles, roughly, right? Um, and it's worth about $1,500 uh, today. Now, that Honda Odyssey, uh, I love my Honda Odyssey. It gets me from point A to point B uh, uh, very reliably. Um, I drive it from the last homely house down to UNH and back again, no problems. I even take it uh, camping trips. I've taken it you know, up into the North Country, up to Berlin and past Berlin, up by the Canadian border. Love it. I can camp in it. I throw my kayak up on top of it. And I don't care if it gets bumped or bruised or scratched. It's, it's 17 years old and it's worth $1,500. But it gets me around from point A to point B. Now, so that's, and it gets me around just as well as say a brand new Tesla does, right? Now, what's the difference between a 2004 Honda Odyssey, highly reliable, uh, well, status, right? Nobody is seeing me coming with my, 17 year old minivan saying that dude must be cool right he's got a you know he's got a almost 20 year old um minivan um so it gives me not only does it probably not give me status but it might even be negative you know i'm pretty sure i've been pulled over a couple of times driving my minivan and i think i've gotten off uh because the cop felt bad that he said, man, you're a 50 something year old man and you're still driving a beat up old minivan, feel bad for you, not gonna give you a ticket. As opposed to if I was driving a brand new, you know, bright red Tesla, I'm pretty sure that he maybe would give me an extra ticket, right? But people seeing me drive around in a brand new fancy Tesla might think I'm really cool. So the beautiful thing about the Honda Odyssey is I don't have a car payment, right? I haven't had a car payment in probably, uh, well, never. I, I bought the car. I bought the the um, Odyssey in 2004 uh, with cash because I had saved up money uh, to buy the buy the buy the van. I bought it for my wife, um, uh, and I inherited our old Dodge Caravan, also a minivan. I have been driving a minivan for like a zillion years. Um, I inherited our old Dodge 
uh, uh, grand caravan from my wife. She drove the Honda Odyssey for about eight years. I drove the, um, uh, for the most of the time I drove the, the, uh, old caravan. And then, um, we eventually got rid of the caravan and I inherited the Odyssey and she got a, a another new car, uh, which we also paid for with cash. Right. Um, so, uh, you might not be in a position to be able to buy a new car with cash. That's okay. You don't have to buy a new car, right? You could buy a used car. You could buy yourself a 17 year old Honda Odyssey, right? Um, unless you just don't want to be seen driving an old mom vehicle, right? Uh, but I don't have a problem with that. I don't care. Um, and what that does is it eliminates a large discretionary payment that, you know, I see a lot of people getting a new car every three to four years. And that means they always have a car payment. Well, you could turn that car payment to zero by getting an older car. You don't have to drive a 17-year-old car, but you could buy a car that you actually say it can save enough money to pay for uh, you know, out of pocket. We could talk, we'll talk more about that another time, but car payment, that's a, my point here is that's a discretionary fixed expense. Now, most people can't live without a car. So I'm not saying that you can just be without a car, right? I live in a relatively rural area. You have to have a car. If you want to go grocery shopping, you have to have a car. You want to get to the doctor, you have to have a car. If you live in downtown Boston, you can just take the T, right? Uh, or take an Uber, whatever. Then you don't need a car. In fact, the car would be a burden. Um, so car payment, good example, cable, uh, and internet, right? So we get raked over the coals by Verizon. Uh, no, not Verizon Comcast. They're the only dealer in town. So they charge us ridiculous amount of money, uh, to get cable and internet access at our house. Um, uh, you know, even with, we try to get like the most stripped down cable, uh, and it still costs an arm and a leg. That's a fixed cost. We could choose not to have cable and internet at our house. Uh, my wife won't let me not have cable. And I certainly don't want to live without internet, but we could choose not to, right? So it's discretionary and it comes in at a fixed cost every month, right? So car payments, a fixed cost every month, cables, a fixed cost every month, cell phone, right? Cell phone service, as opposed to the actual phone, the cell phone service is, is another example of, you know, again, getting raked over the coals uh, in terms of cost, but it's a monthly fee. It's not, it's not based on the number of days or the number, the number of units. You pay one fee and you just use it. Other subscription things like gym memberships, maybe um, museum memberships, other stuff like that. This is, you know, monthly fee. And then, um, you know, and then anything else like newspapers, magazines, some subscription style format, like a gym, all these things are kind of subscription style format, right? Anything else like that. So now we're tagging on car payment. Right. Now we're tagging on um, uh, internet. Now we're tagging on cell service. Right. And what you can see is all these fixed expenses, they don't change over 30 days, right? They're not going up. They're not going down. It's one price covers the whole month. And so we're ratcheting up, right? And we're decreasing our room to maneuver our financial freedom. Okay. But we're not done. Wait, wait, there's more, right? Um, I want to talk to a real evil in my mind, and that is consumer debt, Consumer debt um, is, let's say you go into Best Buy, right? And you see this new 72-inch TV, right? And you just say, you know, with surround sound speakers, right? And you say, I, I, I really want that. But you know what? It's, say, $3,600, right? And you don't have $3,600 in the bank. Uh, that you can just, you know, uh, just just uh, pull out a checkbook and write a check for thirty six hundred dollars. Um, the the cashier um, or the uh, clerk says, "No problem. We'll just put it on credit for you, and you can make twelve easy payments of three hundred dollars per month." And you say, that sounds like a brilliant idea. Let me buy this thing that's going to depreciate uh, in value the moment I take it out of the store um, and bring it home and incur consumer debt, which will turn into right, a fixed expense each month that was totally discretionary. 
You do not need a 72 inch TV. You may want one, right? But you do not need it. So my advice to, to you as young people is do not buy things um, that are primarily for entertainment or consumption uh, on uh, credit, right? Because what that does is now you have, you've spread your TV payment, right? Your consumer debt, whatever it might be, TV or whatever. even worse is when you use credit cards to go to uh, the bar or whatever, and you ring up big bills on your credit cards, right? And then now you are capitalizing um, consumption, which is terrible. Um, so, uh, and, and I'll do a step, there's going to be, a, I'm going to have a separate video on consumer debt and credit cards and so forth. But uh, so once again, it compresses and takes away your freedom to maneuver. All right. So let's talk now over here about the flexible column. So the fixed column is these are fixed payments that don't vary based on how much you use of something. It's, it's one payment and you get, you know, you get the use of that thing for, uh, for the month. Now over here uh, with uh, uh, flexible and mandatory, put food, right? You just, food is definitely mandatory. You got to buy it, right? This cannot, this nothing up here can go to zero. Nothing up here in this row can go to zero. So food, you have to spend food money on food, but it is flexible in the sense that it changes with time, right? Uh, each day you're going to spend a little more on food in order to stay alive. Um, but you also have a lot of control over how much you spend on food. And that is primarily between choosing between, um, you know, eating at home, and eating in a restaurant. So when we, if we're, I'm going to graph it separately for a minute. So thinking about our resources versus days, right? Food increases, right? Over time, each day you're spending a little more, a little more, a little more. Now, how steep this line is depends on how much you spend each day. Now, you can either um, cook at home or eat out, right? So back in the, up through the 60s, um, I believe if I got the, the dates right, up through the 60s, about 50% of the average American household's spending was on food. So the average American household brought in, say $100 a month, they spent $50 a month on food. Today, uh, and I think the last time I looked at this was like 2014, the number is now down to something like 10% uh, of the average American household. So we've gotten a lot richer. We spend a lot less on food and a lot more on other things. Um, but back in the day, back in the 50s, something like 90% of their spend of that, of that large portion of their budget was spent on cooking at home. Uh, and only about 10% was spent on eating out. And if you're a person of a certain age, like myself, you know, my wife and I often talk about how back in the day when we were kids, uh, we would only eat out at a nice restaurant, maybe, you know, once or twice a year. Today, my wife and I really like eating out. And so we eat out at a nice restaurant probably once or twice a week, you know, probably, you know, uh, 1.5 times a week, let's say. Um, so, and that's true of the average American household as well instead of 90% and 10%, like it was back in the day, today it's more like 50% and 50%, right? So the average American household spends uh, a lot less as a percentage of their overall budget on food, but they spend 50% of it, uh, of, their, of their food budget on eating out. And that includes everything from going to a nice restaurant to, you know, picking up a cup of coffee at, you know, a $4 cup of coffee at, Dunk, at Dunks on the way to work. So you can have, if you cook at home, right, the line is going to increase like this. If you cook, if you choose to eat out a lot, the line is going to go up, you know, more like this. So more like if you dominate, if eating out dominates cooking at home, the line is going to go up a lot faster. Okay. So if we draw that on our graph, right, we're going to now have, you know, our food increasing. So it's a flexible amount. So it's changing 
right, with consumption. And we can make choices. We can make that steeper or shallower depending on how we choose to manage our food, uh, food consumption, uh, whether we eat at home or, or, uh, or eat out. Another um, mandatory but flexible uh, uh, cost is going to be transportation. Right. which is in addition to the car payment or not, depending on if you uh, are able to pay your car off. Um, and this would include, you know, public transportation. It would include gas. If you have a car, um, it would include whatever else you're spending. So you, it's flexible, right? You can um, spend more or less, you know, you could choose to Uber instead of riding the, uh, riding the T in Boston, right? That'll make your, make your, your trips more expensive. It is mandatory because you've got to be able to get, for most of us, we've got to be able to get to a job. So, uh, so flexible, uh, we could add, you know, something else like transportation. And what you can see is by the end of the month, we're squeezing uh, uh, our income, excuse me, our financial freedom to a very small amount. And what's left here, right? This financial freedom of what's left here, right? Because by the end of it, you're going to need to be able to spend. Um, is left for that flexible discretionary, and there'll be other things in here as well, um, you know. And if you're down here, so fixed discretion, uh, fixed discretionary, I would include things like childcare potentially if you're, you know, if you have small children. Um, and it depends. You could we could argue uh, uh, whether it's mandatory or discretionary um, uh, there. And again, like I said, you can make an argument about about where each thing belongs in here. But I think this is a useful heuristic. And so the last component, this flexible discretionary, I put in things like entertainment. So that's going out with friends, right? That is going to the movies. That is um, taking a vacation. Uh, you know, all the fun stuff that uh, isn't a fixed amount, right? Um, you know, so things like, you know, a Netflix membership is over here. It's discretionary, but it's fixed. So over here is something like going to the movies. If you go to the movies more, you wind up with a uh, higher total bill. If you go to the movies less, you, got, you have, wind up with a lower total bill. Um, but that last category is what you can do if you make yourself right some uh, space to maneuver, so uh, so financial success, the key is really controlling these three categories so that you can spend on this category and in particular these two categories, right? Because these are the categories that once you're committed, you're just you, there's no flexibility there which is why things like consumer debt, when they seem like a really good idea the, the day you're in there looking at the cool uh, uh, TV, sounds like a great idea. When you can't go out with your friends because you've got to pay, you know, you've got to keep on paying that bill on your TV, you start to feel pretty bad. The smaller this gap is at the end of the month, the less discretionary fun you get to have. And so the less, you know, so this is a real dissatisfier. This will make people unhappy. Um, and so the goal is, should be to try to especially push down these fixed expenses down as low as you can, and then carefully manage these flexible mandatory expenses so that you can maintain as wide a margin as you possibly can. All right. Um, so hopefully That's a useful heuristic for you to think about managing your own expenses. And uh, I'll talk on uh, next video I'm going to do is going to be about saving and kind of managing your savings, uh, short-term savings. And then I'll plan to do another video about in some basics on investments and insurance. All right. So please let me know if you liked the video and you found it useful and feel free to share it with friends.